All right, sir. We're right. doing it live, but not really live. <laughs> understood. Understood. All right. How are you today, sir? I'm doing awesome, actually. Just had like a nice hour long meditation, so I'm in a chill type of mood. I have dabbled in meditation. I need to do it more often. Um, I was taught mindfulness meditation as part of my stint in therapy. And yeah, sometimes that is exactly what you need. That is a definite fact. You just got to be consistent with it. It sticks. I mean, listen, something people have been doing for 2,000 years, it obviously works. There's so, definitely something you know, to it. You know, if, if it sticks around that. for that long. Right? Absolutely. So... You are uh, PD, uh, how do you say that? Olivia? Oliva? Close, close. Oliva. Oliva. Yeah. Kind of like the medication Olive just added, uh. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. All righty. So, you, I was just checking out your websites before we started the call, and you have quite a bit to say about yourself on your websites. Ah. So, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about what you have wow. to say? All right, so I'm um, P.D. Oliva. I write science fiction and horror novels. Oh, I kind of write a, a lot of different genres, actually. So I have six books published. Um, last, this very sixth book just came out. It's a dystopian sci-fi series titled The Rose. Other than that, I have written everything from non-fiction, so philosophical, self-help book. Uh, so I'm also a hypnotist and behavioral therapist. And... Uh, psych thriller, dark fiction, even like a, I call it my Hallmark card book, right? So, and that's a family saga that takes place over, um, takes the family over four generations. And there's a metaphysical twist to it. Hmm. Yeah. All right, then. All right. So that's, you know, and that what you just gave us is a, a fairly decent segue into what I wanted to lead with, and that is right. full disclosure, uh, because I'm, I, I like to be upfront and honest, man, your book is fucking weird. <laughs> ah, yes, I love it, dude. I love it. I love your it. book is weird. Like, it just goes right. I, I started reading it and I was like, all right, where's he going with this? And just as, as more and more information came to light, and I got more and more of the plot, I'm like. We're just going down one rabbit hole after yeah. the fucking other here. Yeah, I love the rabbit hole, man. I live down in the rabbit hole, so a lot going on down I there. I know that feeling. God knows <laughs> I know that feeling. Too funny. That's classic. I love it. I love the reaction. It's all about the reaction, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It... Yeah, if you get a reaction, that's mm -hmm. the first step is getting, right. you know, getting them to care enough to react. That is absolutely the first step. I agree with you. So, I I, I just gotta I gotta ask what what gave you the idea to transform vampires and into aliens? What where where did you yeah. get the idea to merge those two? Because they usually live totally separately. They do definitely. There's um. All right, so there's a couple different ways that it came about. There's first of all Buck Rogers in the 25th century was a, um, I think it started out in Pulp Fiction magazine, but there was a series in the late 70s, early 80s that I watched, and that was one of the episodes, that was probably like three or four, had an alien vampire in it. And he was so scary, it frightened, scared the hell out of me. So it stayed with me for a long period of time. And then of course, you know, he grows to get a little older, and I'm into a lot of alien lore, you know, the whole ancient alien thing. And I'm thinking in my head, I said, hmm, what if vampires were real and they were really just aliens? It kind of in a strange, bizarre way it made perfect sense. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not opposed to the idea of alien life myself because it, it logically it makes sense to me. You know, we have mm -hmm. untold number of planets. It right. makes sense that one of them would have life on it. Come on now, be reasonable right. here. <laughs> whether they've been here or not, that's a whole separate debate. But whether or not they exist, I think, is mathematically beyond question. Agreed. One hundred percent. So, yeah, I mean, why why wouldn't one of them think we were particularly tasty? Yeah, I, I, think, right. I guess that's reasonable. <laughs> you know, you're going to have good aliens, you're going to have bad aliens, right? And where do these aliens come from? Where do they live? They're obviously going to be different than us. Their chemistry is going to be different. The way they act in, you know, fatigue is going to be different. So why not, right? Yeah. Bring it together. Why not? There you go. So in that same, in that same vein... 
Uh, you also have lichens, and I was yes. it, it wasn't completely clear to me if the lichens in your story were another alien race or if they were genetically modified humans. Genetically modified humans. Also okay. pets for the alien vampire. Got it. Got yeah. it. Because yeah, it wasn't it wasn't crystal clear to me. I mean, it was clear they were pets, but I wasn't sure if they mm -hmm. were experiments or if they were a whole separate race. Gotcha. Yeah, just an experiment. Gotcha. They do a lot of genetic experiments yeah. on those humans, right? Oh God, that is probably you know. I uh, I'm a personal trainer, and I have an immense interest in the science of the human body and genetic science. I actually uh, sent my genome off to a genetics company to be fully mapped out, so I can find my ancestry and all the quirks of nice. my particular genetic makeup. That that science fascinates me, and so that particular aspect of your book was intriguing to me, and I was really wondering where it was going. And at the end of the book, we're still not fully sure what the purpose of this genetic experimentation is. That's right. You got to wait for book two on that. <laughs> right. Can't say anything, you know. And Son then it, it, it's part of the series that's it's like, like you were saying before, were aliens here, you know, back in the day or whatever, you know. So a lot of what the entire series is going to be questioned is, all right, so were they here? When did they get here, and why are they in the shadows? Like those ancient alien questions are what I'm seeking to answer throughout this series, and part of that is that genetic experimentation. And you know, that's that's been a mainstay of a lot of um, aliens exist theories is that they've interacted with us to use us as lab rats, and and your angle, you you go into it a little bit. Uh, in that they talk about using humans as like they talk about like factory farming us like we do cattle and they yeah. talk about using us as like an ideal labor force and so that particularly um, drew my interest but then at the end of the book you make it clear that almost or more than two thirds of the human race has been wiped out by the third world war that we're set after as well as annihilation efforts by these aliens. And so that kind of made me think is is the we're making them into food and slaves. Is that a red herring? Is there a greater design? Because why would you wipe out so many of the thing that you're supposed to be eating? <laughs> understood, understood. It's not per se a red herring, all right, but there is a very specific reason for it that you will find out in the upcoming book. Okay. Of why they, they are wiping out the population in that respect for a certain reason, and they're trying to get the population into small little pockets of population for a very specific reason. Interesting. See, yeah. uh, <sighs> now, now you got me curious. <laughs> nice. That's good. Yeah, I mean, that is my mind likes to wander away with theories on what these things could be and I can I think I could come up with a few reasons why they would want to do that but but the the scope that your book goes into and some of the stuff you deal with like like the rose just as an example it makes me think about the different aspects that that they could be going for with this uh, experimentation they're doing and it just makes me like you i don't think you'd go where i would go with it so <laughs> understood understood it definitely um well let's put it this way i'll give you it's maybe this is a slight hint so we'll see so the rose is volume one volume two and then we're gonna it transfer right so the series is going to continue but it's going to be a different type of trilogy right that happens about 10 years after the Rose Volume 1 Volume 2 take place. And the name of that is called the Indigo Trials, and that's to deal with um, indigo children. Okay. And, you know, it's fun. I have a question relating to that later on, but I don't want to I don't want to skip just, steps uh, here. Uh, so uh, in that same vein about the Rose, um, that's kind of an interesting little concept. It's clearly some kind of a psychic discipline, and it, it even... It even might be a spiritual discipline. It kind of seems like it has that kind it of is. reverence, and so I Alchemy. wanted to hear. I wanted to hear more about your thought process creating that. One hundred percent. It's based on a meditation, an alchemy meditation, 
All right. So uh, a friend of mine was um, getting trained by an alchemist, and he had received this email that was an alchemy meditation titled The Rose. And the, the purpose was it was not to change um, lead into gold, but the purpose behind this meditation was for protection from something called energy vampire. All right. So when you're doing this meditation, you're picturing a rose at, at your fingertips, and it puts like a veil of protection around your your ethereal plane. All right, so nobody could come into your plane without you specifically choosing them to do so, and that's the purpose of this meditation. So I was like, that's really cool. I like that, but I need to up it and add a little bit more to it. You know, as far as changing all the chemical structures within that plane, and the, the stronger you grow in that practice, your plane you can expand your plane as well. Right. And you definitely, you definitely make that clear because we go all the way from, we see a pretty wide spectrum of what it's capable of in Sandy, who only has a very basic introduction to it. She's mm -hmm. able to use it to regain control of her body and push through paralytic medication. And then all the way up to master users who are able to rearrange matter at a molecular level using it. Yeah. And, right. and move things telepathically. And so we have a very wide spectrum of what this thing can be used That's and right. done and you can do with it. And there's a reason why Sandy's able to um, to use it so quickly that you'll find out in part two. Yeah, I figured it had something to do with, with the indigo race yeah. that you keep alluding to. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, can't say too much. It's in there. It's coming. Though. He's like, I'm actually just you. sitting down to write part two, like right now, as we speak. I've been um, thinking about it. And what I do is I send myself email. I'm an email type of guy. So I get the idea in my head, something in the story I want to include on an email to myself. So I've been looking through all those old emails. And I'm like, you know, it gets the juices flowing. It's like, all right, let's go. You know, part two's coming. And I'm a part two guy, you know, so, you know, I'm the Godfather part two, I'm the, you know, Empire Strikes Back, I'm the Dark Knight type of guy. So this book to me is highly important. So yeah. I can't wait. So I understand excited. that. And, and I can even understand that mindset to a, to a large degree too, because the beginning is obviously important because you have to set everything up and you have to draw people in and hook them with the beginning. Yeah. But if you don't escalate and raise the stakes in part two and continue to build and keep it interesting, That's then right. people tune out. So I understand the the part two mindset. Yeah, we got to build on it. It's like, um, I read about that too. They were describing um, Harry Potter and how Harry Potter, each one, each book, each installment is just escalating to the next one. And it was done brilliantly over the series. So, you know, keeping that in, in mind is like plan the entire series. What's the escalation? How do these stakes get up? What's going to happen this time? Without having getting, um, I think, redundant, you know, is the trick not falling into that redundancy and keeping it fresh every time. Yeah. You know, it's absolutely the most important part. You know, every book should stand out on its own. You know, of course, the whole series as a whole, but each book should have its own individual quality. I agree. Right. You You have to keep it fresh and you have to give the readers. I heard it very, very intelligently sur surmised. Is that the word I want there? Summarized. Summarized is the word I want there. Summarized like this. You have to give the people what they want, but not how they expect it. Yes. Yeah. That is part of it. That's yeah. right. I love that because it's it really gets right down to the meat of the issue, and it's nice and quick, and it's easy to remember. I love, yeah, I love that right. little bit of advice. I do, I do, and then throw in some surprises, you know, as well. So those twists and turns, it's like, holy cow! I thought it was going this way, and it completely blew my mind. Or that just came yeah. out of left field, like I didn't see anything yeah. even remotely related to that coming. That's I right. like those personally in I, my own writing. I like doing that. Agreed. I love coming out of left field. That's where the liking came in. I was like, wait a minute, you know, what am I building up to here? And all of a sudden, I was just liking hanging out. Like, awesome. Keep going with it, right? Yeah. What else do I got? The Thorks were one of my personal favorites, though. Just the way they eat, I love. I love how that came out. It's very uh, spider-like. Yes. Um, the Fly. Did you ever see The Fly with Jeff Goldblum? Can't say I have. Ah, uh, watch it. You'll love it. So good. <laughs> and then how flies eat. Oh, it's great, dude. 
So that's where I got the idea for the fort. So we'll definitely watch that movie. It's a good one. All right. Noted. All right. Definitely. So uh, moving right along, um, this one is a, in a different vein of question. And this one goes more towards like themes or possible like uh, um, commentary that you might have been going for with your writing. Uh, you tell me. So uh, you go a little bit into the formula of these medications and these these pills that they're feeding humanity. And then yeah. we see some of the really <laughs> dramatic effects it has on the vampires who feed on these humans. And so were you going for some social commentary on addiction with what happens yeah. to Thanos? Or was that just part of the story? It, it's definitely... Um... Definitely my little tidbit on my, um, I work in the addiction field. I have for about 15 years. So we've always had our theories. And then we find out the uh, owner of Purdue Farmer, the CEO, is a, from what I understand, a Nazi. You know, you kind of tend to put these things together and say, okay, let me, let me add this little conspiracy theory that it, we kind of talk about in social circles within the industry and stuff like that, you know. And um, so, yeah, I wanted to put that in there, 100%. Gotcha. Cause, yeah, because yeah, I definitely picked up on that. I mean, it, it you can read what Thanos goes through and, and the process behind the drugs being created. And then later on, they're talking about their, we're no better than the humans. We're being treated like lab rats thing. And you're like, you get, a, you're like, this guy has some really strong opinions about he does. drugs. <laughs> that he does, man. That he does. It's classic. It just turns into an absolute monster. Yep. Yeah, I mean, he. Yeah, he does turn into an absolute monster. Yes. Absolutely. Who's badass? He's my favorite. <laughs> my baby alien vampire. You know? My baby. <laughs> <laughs> my little villain spawn. As opposed, my as opposed right. to the actual baby alien vampire. <laughs> I, know, I know. I know. Which is funny when uh, one of my beta readers when she read that uh, that part with the baby, she's like, "He gave me night with the baby and Sandy." If you know what I mean. Uh, I must have missed a word there. Repeat that, please. All right. So uh, one of the, my beta readers said that I gave her nightmares when um, Sandy first discovers what's going on with her baby in a genetic experimentation okay. that happened, and the baby kind of takes a little nibble. So <laughs> it's just like I have I, nightmares. I it can imagine, classic. especially for a mother, or especially like a new mother, that would be absolute nightmare right? fuel. <laughs> I know. I know. God, women have a hard job. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Like... yeah. So this one, I swear I'm not. I swear I'm not trying to be a dick. <laughs> I gotcha. But, but I got to nitpick on this one because my particularly what I, I, I like I said I'm a personal trainer and the physical world and how it works and especially the the science of movement and. Um, how you get things done with your body is one of the mm -hmm. things I pay close attention to. I actually Understood. have an entire video on my YouTube channel talking about physical feats in fiction. And I have another one talking about researching uh, action and how to write action well. And so it's that's a niche I care about. <laughs> and so this, gotcha. this thing, All right. All right. it's nitpicky, but it bugged the hell out of me. So I got to ask you about it. So, go for it. So the blades. You, yes. you, you describe them, uh, you, you do quite a bit of work of describing how this thing is hooked up to your arm. And I reread the passage a few times to make sure I understood it properly. And okay. correct me if I'm wrong, but you have, a, you have a hook that goes around, around your wrist. Correct. And you have uh, basically a guide for the blade that runs up the back of your arm. And then it hooks up above your up elbow. Up to the elbow. Right above the elbow. Right above the elbow. Okay. Yeah, not... Yeah, not higher up by the shoulder, but say below the elbow right here. Okay, below the elbow. Yes. Okay. So like that. See, that's 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 the point I wanted to really hammer in on because right. in the text of the book, it specifically says uh, above the elbow. Uh, gotcha, the, the metal gotcha, blade descended gotcha. from the handles down across the arm bone to the elbow clamp and locked. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I copy and pasted it into my notes here. Uh, the wrist and just above the elbow. So, and so my question was, if it hooks up just above the elbow, how the hell do you bend your arm? Right. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. 
little typo. We'll have to change that. Okay. Right. Yeah, because because I I'm I'm not a martial artist. It's something that's one of the things that I want to get into still. Um, but I do enjoy watching fighting videos, especially uh, MMA, because the displays of physical power are amazing. Some awesome. of the things that people are able to do physically. And, and yeah, and so I was thinking about if if it's above the elbow, how is he doing all the flexion of the elbow that you need to do right. to properly use a tonfa-like weapon? <laughs> so Big that one body. was driving me nuts. <laughs> driving the body, huh? I apologize. I, 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 like I said, it's not like the end of the world, and you could have had an explanation for it like... That there's a few ways you could um, design the weapon that would, uh, like maybe this clamp like up here for is it. elastic, and so when you bend your elbow, the track bends off or flexes off on some kind of a extendable anchor. There's a few things you could have done there. I just had to ask about it because, like I said, it was driving me nuts. I was like, gotcha. how, is, how is he bending his elbow to do these moves? Because I can visualize how he would be cutting through people and per, and executing these moves, especially spinning moves, because in a spinning move, you're trying to build momentum. And so at the end of that spin, you're going to go from a flexed elbow to an extended elbow to really build that momentum to get all of your slicing power. And I was like, if you can't bend your elbow, how is he going to do happen. that? Too funny. Well, there you go. I hope the playing seeds are better for you now. Oh, man. So, yeah, that was, that was getting to me. So, it was intended to be below the elbow. Got it. Correct. Yeah, and that <laughs> and that makes perfect sense because that, that's much more like a real-world tonfa. And it allows... I mean, anyone who that knows anything access. about martial arts knows if you can't bend your elbow, you're in a world of trouble. <laughs> Fact. In a big world of trouble. <laughs> so, uh, we already talked about Sandy a little bit, and uh, I got to tell you, I hate her. <laughs> I gotcha. hate that character. <laughs> and so I just have to ask, was, was she intended to just be incredibly stupid or is she yeah. like under some kind of vampire influence or, or what's going on with her? Because god she's damn, in, she's stupid. <laughs> she's intended to be very naive. And then there's that whole part, you know, her parents died. She grew up in this mansion by herself pretty much. You know, and there, there's a mystery behind that, which you'll find out more about as well. And then her parents died mysteriously when she was 10 years old. But you'll find out too, there's a block of time that she doesn't remember from 10 to 14 when she met that, all right? And you'll discover what that block of time is and why she's so naive in part two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Be Specifically because, meant to be naive. Uh, all right. Because it was, oh my God. It just seemed like one thing after the other, it was driving me nuts. First, she ran, yeah. first she yelled out the window and grew, and drew the soldier's attention. Then mm -hmm. she, then she, uh, was just acting like a complete moron most of the book, and then she went back to save the alien vampire who genetically mm -hmm. altered her baby. It's like... I, uh -huh. <laughs> I can't. Like, why are you doing this? I couldn't, man. I was like, I hate this broad. <laughs> Stay quiet. You'll find out why, though. You're definitely gonna find out why. Ah, uh, yeah, I hope so, and I. It, <laughs> you will. It too. better be good, man, because let me tell you. <laughs> it is. It's gonna be really good. The really amount good. of it's, frustration. It's a whole setup. You know, it's it, these two volumes are mostly about obviously Sanos and then Phil and Sandy, and then so you're gonna see this huge transformation, especially of Sandy going from that that naive person who this book, you know, the beginning of this book, and then all the way through what she's going through in part two, she's going to be, she's going to be pretty bad at. All right. I'll take your word for it. <sighs> Man. I, although, and I, I gotta say, I kind of thought you were killing her off because the book ends with mm -hmm. her getting bit and he would just kind of like move away from the scene after that. So I, I was like, sure. The book ended with her dying. Yeah, no. No, he said definitely no. not. Definitely <laughs> not. Um, you'll see. Actually, the part two um, picks up like directly after that moment. Once okay. you get bit, that's where part two starts. 
And then you start realizing, oh, shit. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. And then with part two as well, we're going to spend a really decent amount of time in Hollow Work in um, Rock City. So that's going to be a hell of a lot of fun to write. I'm looking forward to it. I see it kind of like a Tesla futuristic um, city, like underground in Middle Earth. So I'm excited to write that. You know, the, the Hollow Earth thing is one of those is one of those theories that I'm like, it, it's like really fun to play with, but I'm not sure how plausible it is because of how hard it is to drill bedrock. But so makes... these caves would have to be semi-natural or there would have to be a soft layer underneath the bedrock. It, but, but it is absolutely fun to play with. Like it some, some of my great picture. Some, right? some of my favorite stories have included, um, uh, uh, some kind of a hollow earth component or played with that concept a little bit like uh in the red rising trilogy they're on mars and they have these amazing claw drill machines that they're called claw drills and they they can just go through anything like butter and so there's an entire underground city that supports an entire rebelling army and nice. it's so good. <laughs> I, I'm actually just about to read that. I'm like, oh, God. away from starting that series. Because I've heard so much about Do it. it. Yeah, it's good, right? Do it. I love the Red Rising. The, the first trilogy is really, really good. And it's this great story of, of a man who defies fate and and freeze and freeze his people and then the second trilogy after the first which is much later is the is this part of the story that we almost never get which is what came after what happens okay. after the big rebellion what happens after the good guys win and i love that pierce picked up and continued writing uh that story because oh my god the second trilogy is every bit as good as the first one <laughs> nice okay good good good, good. i'm excited so highly recommend. there's six books total uh he's not released the sixth one yet i'm waiting and he's pissing me off keeping me waiting the story gotcha. needs to be i need to know <laughs> he left it yeah the, the fifth book ended on such a on such a dramatic cliffhanger we we saw characters uh come back to life that we thought were dead we we saw we saw uh, people narrowly escape death, but they were beaten all to hell. Very, you know, kind of, he's going to bleed out any minute now kind of situation. And, gotcha. And the whole thing was just so dramatic and so well done. And that's where he ended it. And like that's that. where he like ended it. Yeah. Nice. Smart man. Smart man. Yeah. A lot I, of tales on book six. I, I really love Pierce. He actually, I, I read the first one, Red Rising. I was handed an arc for it um, outside of the Seattle Convention Center. I think it was PAX 2014. And when I read that book, I immediately went to my own writing and deleted everything I'd written for my first novel. And I ah. said, I'm, I'm changing my writing style. Because <laughs> Pierce's That's writing funny. style captivated me so much. I, I, I absorbed a little bit of it. That's like um, Blake Crouch, Dark Matter. Like when I read that book, I said, "All right, I gotta up my game a little bit more." He just he just raised the bar on writing. Blake and Dark Matter is phenomenal, and then Recursion was just, I think even better than Dark Matter. You know, I have I have not read any of his work. Uh, just read those two. Dark start with Dark Matter, then read Recursion. And who's Absolutely that by? Phenomenal. Blake Crouch. Blake. And Dark Matter is about um, um, parallel universes universes and it's about this guy who builds this machine that um you could go through parallel universes it's phenomenal and then recursion oh, this concept is great have you ever read a book called time and again by jack finney can't say i have okay so that's a time travel novel excellent novel all right and the way they do time time travels through hypnosis through the mind so he kind of took that concept and brought it into recursion, but instead they have this, it's another machine, it's like you're going through a sensory deprivation tank. And whatever um, memory you have, right, they induce this chemical that when you're feeling that memory inside that memory, 
they induce this chemical in the brain, you go back in time into that memory and you can start all over from that period in time. And it's, it just keeps going. It, governments want this technology. It's just, it's wild. It's a wild ride, research. It's a good one. You'll like it. You'll definitely like it. Seems like that's where your mind goes. It's on my notepad. Yeah. When I have time, I will check it out. I've got like, yeah. I've got Megalator's Cyborg, Cyborg Tinker in the mail. Ready Player Two is in the mail. And obviously I have all the books that I got to read interviewing you guys. I, yeah. I got a book from you, what from one of my interview authors every week that I got to read. So yeah. I got a pretty you full plate right now, it. but it's on the list. How do you do? How do you do? I'm, um, I got Ready Player Two. That's on the list as well. And then what's the name? B.E. Schwab came out with a new book, um, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. And I love B.E. Schwab's Vicious and Vengeful. Did you ever have you read those? Those are good ones too. Yeah, definitely good ones. Um, so she has a new book, and that, I'm waiting for that to come. I'm excited to read that. From what I read, good reviews, great reviews. People are saying it's like a masterpiece. So we'll see. We will see. You know, uh, here's a book that I have read that you might like because it kind of plays with something that is you is in your own work and the genetic experimentation thing. Uh, right. You ever read Lives of the Monster Dogs? No. Oh. I love the title, though. Lives of the Monster Dogs? Lives of the Monster Dogs. I can't remember the author uh, because, unfortunately, I just do not have a very good mind for keeping track of names like that. But Lives of the Monster Dogs, I read it in high school, and it was because it was in my uh, high school's library, and we had to do uh, you know English class book report, go pick a book, and man, it was so good. It it yeah. it was, yeah, it was uh, the Nazis. Kirsten Backus. Kirsten Backus. That Is sounds right. Yep, yep. And so so the Nazis were trying to create the perfect soldier. And so they experimented on dogs until they were able to get dogs up to human level intelligence. And they gave them, uh, they altered their bodies so they could stand upright. And they gave them mechanical prosthetic hands so they could use a firearm. And they had these dog soldiers. And awesome. yeah, it's, it's a so very fun. good book. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend checking that out because it, again, it it explores the uh, the side of the story you don't normally get. Okay, so the Nazis created these hyper intelligent dog soldiers, and what happened to them after the war ended? And that's what the book is about. Gotcha. And that's oh god, it's so good. It's real. Nice. Good. Is it a series or just standalone? It's a standalone, as far as I know. Nice. Okay, I will definitely. I got it on. Uh, I got it on my um, Google, so I'll definitely buy it if you were done. It sounds pretty wicked. <laughs> I, I so. love that book. Like I said, it's it's one of those books I read at once as a kid, and it stuck with me my entire life since I read it because it just made that much of an impact on me. All right, there's a lot of books like that, right? I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. Like you said, you're that's you're supposed it, to get a reaction. Exactly, it's all about the reaction. I went to a uh, film class, right? So I wanted to be the director. Yeah. Um, I took two classes this film class, and um, that we're supposed to do this five-minute video, you know, or five-minute movie, and that's what the um, professor said. He said it doesn't matter, you know, it, it, all that matters is the impact that it has, right? You know, when people watch it, what's the ending? How are they walking out of that theater? What are they thinking? What's the impact you're going to have? You know, in the last, I mean, look at the movie Saw, right? I mean, the ending is absolutely phenomenal. Nobody expected it. You're like, holy cow! And that's the last what? two minutes, maybe 30 seconds, you know, he just gets up and walks out and it just absolutely made the movie. So it's all about impact. Yeah. And you know, the, like you say, the ending, the last little bit, what they, what they, what they latch onto when they're walking out of that theater. Uh, there's a little bit of human psychology. I'm sure you're familiar with people generally only remember the last two or three things you said. You can mm -hmm. have like this big long speech, but they really only remember like maybe the last 30 or 40 seconds of what you said. That's what they That's really right. remember when they're walking away. And humans are like that with everything. And yeah. stories are no exception. So you that's why good endings are so important. And yeah, yeah, I didn't watch the Saw movies, but I've 
they're they're a meme oh, at this I'm point. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I don't they're care. They're for I know. Gotcha. I, I don't all really. Right. Horror isn't my genre. And if I am going to watch horror, it's typically paranormal horror because then there's at least something else going on. It's not just blood and guts and jump scares. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the Saw movies had that had that awesome ending that you just weren't expecting, like you said. And that's why they made such a big impact because people weren't expecting it. Okay. And and then plus the concept, the guy, a guy who tortures people to impart a life lesson it's, and, uh, it's like a that's like a macabre fairy tale from the brothers grim or something right. <laughs> Fact. What are you saying? well all right man uh i got no more questions for you is there anything else you want people to know about your book any Ooh. um at Oh, actually, I do have one final closing question, but first, yeah, is there anything you want people to know about your book or your writing in general? Um, yeah, it's awesome. Um, go to <laughs> pdaliva.com, you know, start the adventure, you know, go through the series, we get seven books, but I also write horror um, books as well, horror thrillers. I have a um, horror thriller, first one coming out is probably next year called Gollum. Definitely a disturbing type of book. And then one I actually just finished. Day before Thanksgiving, I wrote the end, and then I put a question mark. So I felt this has been my quarantine book. It's called Jiggly Spot in the Zero Intellect, and um, <laughs> it's like cosmic horror, grindhouse. Like it's so over the top. And he talks about um, you think the rose is crazy? Wait until you read this one. It's oh God! Absolutely insane. <laughs> so, really? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, he was like, I have to one up myself. <laughs> I did. I don't even know where this shit came from, dude, but it came, and it's it's been a fun journey. Eight months it took me to write the book. 154,000 words, but it, I'm happy. It was one half of a That's a pretty meaty book. That. That's a pretty yeah, meaty book. I, yeah, I like writing long novels. So keep yeah. it going. Gollum's the same thing, probably about 145. So, yeah, bring it nice. on. Nice. Nice. My first novel is 146, and then the sequel is like 99. So yeah, gotcha. I'm not scared right. of the long boys either, for by any nah, means. Definitely not. When is your book out? Your first book is out already. It's at, it's with the editor right now. Me and with her are editing right now. I'm hoping to have it out hopefully early next year. Nice, good for you. Exciting time, man. Very oh exciting. God, I'm tell you, my my right now, I'm just like. I'm trying to figure out a marketing plan and trying to get that squared away because that's that's the trick yeah. of it all, ain't it? Getting people to know your book exists it and buy it. <laughs> it is. I mean, that is what it is. I do a lot of, um, like, uh, build my mailing list. That seems to be going really good. And I'm having a lot of success with, um, like, book funnel and promos and being involved with other authors and stuff. So definitely it's a good start. I mean, this is my sixth book, but the first one I've ever actually said, all right, I would like to do this full time and market. I need to market, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what I've been learning. Things have been good so far. I mean, it's yep. a good start, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll then send I get you to come on podcasts with people like yourself, you know, yeah. have conversations, right? So, yeah, that's part of why I'm doing this is, you know, build my platform to market my own stuff, yeah. but also. A, it's good creative fuel to talk to other creatives and, and get their yeah. process and, and share ideas and discuss these things. And the other thing is, I just, I'm, just, I'm just a fan. I like reading yeah. and man, yeah. talk, getting to ask these questions and analyze writing. It's good fun. <laughs> it that really it is. is. That it is. I'll send you an arc of mine when it's done. I think you'll yes. really dig it. Yeah, it's 100%. Then, yeah, I... Yeah, now that I think yeah. about it, it's right up your alley. <laughs> nice. All right, definitely. One hundred percent. So, my last question for you is: yeah. uh, What is the question when people read your writing specifically, but not necessarily the book that I read, which is the Rose uh. Interior? What is the number one question that people ask you that you want answered? So that you could just refer people to this interview and not have to answer this question anymore. <laughs> Ooh, wow! That was the number one question that we get in any of any books. Um, what is it? I'm actually trying to think if there actually is a question. That, yeah, and every interview is, you know, I get this question. Um, what the hell is it? Now? I think I deleted it from memory. I can't even remember what it is. Um, 
Oh, it's always, um, you know, when did you first start writing? That is actually the question. All right, I've been writing since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. I think I got spat out of my mom with a pen in my hand. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, it's, um, I know I'm old and I just started publishing books, but I have actually been writing since, you know, I was a kid. So I wish that question would just cease to exist. <laughs> All right. Tired of answering it. Give me another question. Ask me what the meaning of life is. That's a good question, right? Because the answer is very simple. It's two words, to live, right? And that's it, right? We're born, we breathe, we die. It's over. What you do in between is yours, which is actually a quote from Eddie Vedder's song. But I'm not sure story. I would phrase it that way. I like, uh, I like the answer that the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy gives you which is whatever you want it to be. And I think that's a very uh, elegant approach to the question of what is the meaning of life. Literally, whatever you want it to be, you get to choose it, what your life is about. It is 100%. Most people don't realize um, that they're, they've been creating this all the time, right? Whatever you're getting, you're receiving, you're creating it. So create something different. Start telling yourself positive stories. If your thought process always goes toward, you know, something bad is going to happen or you know, I'm hoping this happens, but all these negative things could happen too. If your thoughts are always going there, start telling yourself a story where that, it, it will work out. And you'll see energy shifts all around you. Right. That's a definite fact. Right. I try to, one thing, my generation is so pessimistic and all of us are so doom and gloom. And I try to tell my friends and, and people that I have casual interactions with, I'm like, you're not helping anything by constantly thinking the world is ending tomorrow. You're not helping anything by living your life like there is no future. You're only making the problem worse. Start exactly. planning like you're going to be alive in 50 years because you're going to be. That's right. Because one day you'll wake up and you'll be 60 and you'll be like, shit, dude. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> live, yeah. live for tomorrow because it's going to come whether you like exactly. it or not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Agreed. All right, man. It's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been awesome talking to you. I look forward uh, to getting to the the rest of your work at some point whenever my docket magically <laughs> frees up. Understood. Understood. We'll get there. And like I said, I do look forward to sending you uh, a, a copy of my arc when it's done because uh, I think you'll really dig it. And I, nice. I'd like your thoughts because... Yeah, no, one hundred percent, man. We have, 100%. We're we have on the some level. similar, we have some similar ideas about some of the crazier aspects of life. And, nice, gotcha. Understood, understood. All right, gonna, yeah, send nice. along, dude. It's send gonna along. be nice. All right, sir. Um, everyone, PD Oliva. Oh, did I get that right? You did. I did. did good. Look you at me did. go. <laughs> All of his stuff is gonna be down in the description. Like, subscribe. Check out his websites, and uh, I will catch you, sir, and the audience later. Yes, be good, my man. Thank All you. All right, be well, sir. You too.